Welcome back to the Starting Strength Series. I'm Mark Ripito, and we're here today with John Wellborn. John is a 10-year veteran of the NFL. Uh, he is also the owner of uh, SoCal Strength and Conditioning and Paleo Brands. We're going to talk about all these all these things that John is doing today. John, thank you for coming in. Thanks, Mark. He's uh, this is a quite a drive from Orange County. It's a good thing there's airplanes. <laughs> huh? The it weather did. was bad on the way, I'm sure. It was an adventure. <laughs> yes. So, I am, uh, let's just preface this for everybody by saying that those of you that are already aware of this, I'm not a sports fan. And as a result of this, I have extremely limited experience with uh, dealing with professional sports people. So, what I thought we'd do today is, is talk to John from a completely different perspective. And there are things about the NFL that have to do with strength and conditioning and recovery and, and nutrition and things like this that uh, he has probably never been asked before. I'm assuming that none of your interviews have ever asked you about sets and reps, right? No, not too often. Well, so what I thought we'd do today is, is get into some of the, the details <laughs> of not only what you're doing now, but the, your tenure career in the NFL and how <clears throat> the aspects of your, uh, of your day at work relate to what we do uh, here at our little strength training gig we've got going. It's he and I have talked quite a bit over the, over the past year about, about what to do about this, and uh, he has come up with an exceptional product. And this product is based on a big depth of experience in what actually takes place when strength and conditioning training is used in a practical sense on the field. And it's a, it's a unique perspective that most people, in, including myself in strength and conditioning, do not have. I mean, we get people strong in the gym. John got strong in the gym and used it for more than just picking up sacks of potatoes and shit. So we're gonna we're gonna talk to him a little bit about that. Uh, first off, why don't you tell us just the just a brief sketch of the of, of your career in terms of where you started out and where you went and how that that occurred. Uh, I started playing football when I was 14 years old at uh, Palos Verdes High School, and I was fortunate enough to uh, start training with a guy named George Zangus. Who was the U.S. powerlifting coach? Right, George Zangus is will be his name will be familiar to a lot of people listening to this. So George uh, right. owned Marathon Nutrition, and they had uh, super suits and belts and wraps. And uh, first pair of wraps I ever yeah. bought, I bought from George Zangus. Yeah. So George was an icon of the community, and so we were fortunate enough. He had a uh, uh, weights in his garage. Imagine that crazy weights in the garage in the eighties. <laughs> and uh, we would go over there, and my training partner, a guy named Tasso Papadakis, got me into it, and Tasso was a pretty strong guy. When he was uh, 15, squatted 500 for five. Oh God! Yeah. Strongest kid I've ever seen. I mean, to this day, probably one of the strongest people I've ever been around. And what's he? Was, just a, there's a side. What's he doing? Uh, he's a photographer now. He uh, played football at USC and blew out his knees and it still trains. And, uh, I don't, not too much anymore. I know he was. Um, well, we'll uh, call him later. Yeah, we'll figure we'll, out what we'll, he's been doing. We'll figure him out. But strong dude, and right. I played there for you know four years. I was fortunate enough to get a full scholarship to go play at UC Berkeley. I went up there in 94, and Richard, my first year, then came in and played, and then ended up starting for a couple of years, and uh, got drafted in 1999 uh, to Philadelphia Eagles. I was the second pick in the fourth round. I think I was the 98th pick. Went in there and uh, started as a rookie, and ended up playing there for five years. I uh, was traded to Kansas City Chiefs, played there for four, and then two years ago was went to training camp with the New England Patriots and got injured. And right. um, came out back and had surgery, and that was kind of the end of it. So your total career on the field was 10 years in the uh, NFL? Nine years and then 10 nine. training camps. Right. So not yeah, nine completed years. I got hurt my 10th year. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, that, that uh, aside from all the normal sportscaster stuff, I, I and several of people I know in the in uh, strength conditioning are extremely interested in what the NFL does when you hurt yourself, mm. all right? Because, you know, we've always had to, to manage all of our own injuries ourselves. We, sure. Guys in the, in the private sector out here, so to speak, have got to wade through all 
of the idiocy that is fed to us by physicians in terms of what to do when you get injured. Sure. Well, they're not going to uh, say the same thing to a man that's getting paid four million dollars a year to go out and hit somebody on the football field. Sure. What do you guys? I'm just, you know, I've talked about this a couple of times. What What do you guys do uh, when there's a a minor injury, like a an elbow or a thumb or something like that? What just something that's that would you know have an effect on training in the gym? But it's not a surgical situation. What's what's typically done about that? Uh, usually, you go in the training room, and from there, they you know have you evaluated by a doctor. They kind of discuss the injury, what's going on, and then uh, they kind of try their bag of tricks on you. You know, there's ice and stem and ultrasound and different things that the that the trainers can do to to kind of get you back. And you're right. kind of in intensive treatment, and they try to you know the biggest deal is that everybody in the NFL is injured. Sure. Yeah, like I don't know. I would imagine most of the time. Yeah, right. the, the only time you ever really feel good is about the day before training camp. And then the, <laughs> about after the, uh, the first right. practice, everybody's back to how they used to be. Right. So I think it's um, what you what people kind of forget is that most players are playing injured, and it's just part of the job. Right. So, you know, yeah, ooh, my thumb hurts, my elbow hurts. Well, what does that matter? We, we don't want to hear about that. No, That's what no. The, well, people want to. There's a know, large they, check involved. <laughs> They, they also figure that, you know, you come game time and, you know, anti-inflammatory is a toradol shot, different things, and you go out and you do your job. A little Novocaine. Yeah. That's Works what well. do. So how do you think that differs from what happens to the average guy at the gym? I would imagine the primary difference is the fact that a lot of resources, like for the course of an entire day, sure. are being devoted to fixing that elbow. Sure. Right? Whereas... A normal guy would, generally speaking, be talked into making an appointment with a physical therapist. Well, the, the other twice thing a week is, or something like. That. Is it's not as if uh, your weight room has a huge training room right off of it with right. uh, trainers and uh, doctors and different people. Right. So actually, if you had an injury, you could send them into the training immediately and be like, "Hey, you're going to go in there and you're going to, you know, use these different modalities and see a doctor instantly." So there's ice, heat, yeah, stem, massage, stem, stem, all the stuff that's available. On site, on site, anytime you need it, yeah, chiropractor, ART, stuff like that. So at at my home gym, uh, SoCal Strength and Conditioning, we actually have a chiropractic uh, and ART on in, on staff in the building. So if we really? have any issues, like if somebody's like, "Oh, my back is tight" or whatever, we just literally push them right into the doctor and go ahead. It's a part of the training situation yeah, there. With, I mean, it just, it's kind of how I was, uh, you know, my whole life with, with, uh, with training and football. We always had doctors and people there to work on injuries. Right. So why should it be any different in my home gym? So well, we that's that. true. Except so, that it's hideously expensive to keep these people employed. That's true. But, you know, hopefully everybody has decent insurance and they can get right. in there. And, you know, at the end of the day, if uh, you have a, an injury that can be fixed fairly easily, you know, maybe it's a little rehab and a couple different things, and it gets people back to training faster than opposed to them dealing with it for six weeks. Sure. Well, what happens in the event of uh, a surgical situation? So now, you know, I just recently had an experience with, with shoulder surgery, and I was told by, and I'm sure you are aware of this advice for shoulder injuries, I had a, had a uh, rotator cuff on my right side repaired back in June, and the advice from the first doctor I saw, and the one I actually used, was, was both six weeks of immobility, of complete, don't move your arm. Get the thing off, get it, take it out of the sling, take a shower, and move it around with your other arm. Well, of course, me being, you know, well, yeah, I am. I, I took the sling off after eight days and threw it in the corner and was started pressing you, immediately. Started doing range of motion stuff. Sure. Figured out a way to press. Figured out a way to press the bar with the help of the rings. I'd let the rings ride it up, and started moving the 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 thing under load in two weeks after the surgery. Sure. And when I went back, um, in six weeks, I had a, a, th a complete range of motion in the shoulder, and he was, of course. Uh, Amazed. Uh, he was interested in this, but uh, whether it will make any difference in in what he recommends to most people, I don't know, and I don't know that it that it necessarily would benefit most people because I have had some experience with this, as have you, how you can push an injury. Sure. What in a in a situation where not just my own ego is involved, but where there's money on the line. 
Sure. What do you guys do about a surgical situation post-op that is different than uh, what takes place uh, in doctor's offices and ORs across the country? I couldn't tell you what happens in a normal doctor's office with most normal people because my real exp uh, first exposure to a commercial gym or even training with people that were non-paid uh, athletes was uh, probably about a year ago. So right. uh, up until that time, I'd always either trained at the facility or we'd gone to certain places like uh, athletes' performance in different places where there were specific training facilities for athletes right. that had rehab and different things on staff. So um, uh, in terms of, uh, like, I, I don't necessarily know how, uh, you know, if you had surgery, like, I would think that that would be kind of insane to say, hey, you know, don't do any range of motion. Yeah. Anytime I, I had surgery, um, you know, insulin, we came back and... Uh, when I was in Philadelphia, um, you know, underwater treadmills, and you know, somebody that you came in, you worked with. Non what was your surgery in Philadelphia? Uh, I ruptured my patellar tendon in '99, and came back, and actually, my leg was uh, straightened and immobilized for three we or for three weeks. I really didn't walk for three months, and then over the, after about the third week, they started bending it slowly, right. and it took me about a, over a little over a year to rehab and get back from that. So I got hurt, and then came back and started the next year. But that was a pretty intensive, and then I um, had uh, two scopes in my right knee, um, so I got scoped uh, during uh, season. During the season, and came back pretty quick and played again, and then um, and then at the end of the season, I had to go back and get some more stuff cleaned out. So, so how on the scope jobs? How long were you out from each one of those? Oh, uh, the first time it was pretty quick. They just went in there and they cleaned some stuff up, and I think I missed one game. So I got scoped on a Monday and then played the following about a week, two weeks later. Right. And um, how bad was that? In terms uh, of the I tore some meniscus, so they cleaned it up. And then when I went back in there, they went in and they cleaned up a whole bunch of scar tissue and a bunch of stuff. And that actual injury, that surgery, took me longer to come back from. And in the meantime, I was traded to Kansas City. I went out there, and then I kind of got through and played that. And that was uh, I probably shouldn't have played, but I ended up playing that year. Right. So many you feel finished. that caused some long-term problems, in without there. a doubt. Well, but but, but really, post-op, the first, the first, when they went in and, and cleaned the thing out, the yeah. scope. What did they do the next day? Uh, what actually took place in terms of motion? Motion just started, started moving it immediately. Yeah, started moving it. Uh, a lot of ice, a lot of contrast, hot and cold baths, and then you know probably within three or four days, I was actually moving around, walking on the treadmill, right. lifting weights, single leg stuff. And then I probably ran, uh, you know, seven, ten days later, right? And played, you know, fourteen days later. That's interesting about the patellar tendon rupture. I, I would have assumed that they would have been a little more aggressive with that. Well, was it was it down here? Yeah, or, it was a or, mid patellar or, rupture. Well, the the idea is that with a with a tendon is like a lever. You want a right. you know shorter, more powerful lever. Long, you know, you don't want a long lever. So the idea was that they have to let the tendon heal. Right, because if it pulls apart, you'll never get the uh, the strength back in your knee. Right, it changes so, the mechanics. Yeah, it changes the mechanics. So actually, what they would do, <coughs> they wanted the tendon to heal more, uh, you know, really, really well before they did any motion. So they actually sacrificed, you know, some uh, some motion and mobility, different stuff, just because they wanted the tendon to heal properly. Right. You know, and and I was. Uh, you well, know, it's not a vascular structure, and it takes a while for it to but, heal. But you know, here, here I am, um, over ten years later, and I don't have any ill effects from it. Right. You know. So I, I ended up hurting my right knee, which was the one that I had, I had had more internal stuff with an ACL and a different couple of injuries inside. So you had an ACL in the other knee? In the right knee, yeah. How long, did, how'd they do that? Uh, that was in 96 in college. And they did, they used the middle third of my patellar tendon. They drilled two holes and they okay, So it's the them. same procedure I had done. Yeah. That's back when I, in fact, I had mine done that same year. Yeah. They harvest bottom and top so there's a plug of bone on either end of the tendon and then you replace your ACL. It's completely archaic now. Now they yeah. use a cadaver they and use you're in and out in six weeks and you're right. and they, they don't have to hack your knee apart right. and give you tendonitis oh and all God. this horrific shit. That, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you man that no, was, it, it was that was a that was that was bad. It yeah, was really bad. Uh, I did it too. And um, no I, I we, we had a gal at our gym that hurt her knee skiing and she went in and you know uh, cadaver and Six weeks later, she's rocking. Wow! And, you know, and I'm imagining me still having pain. You know, six months later, a year later, still having. Oh yeah. Uh, you know. Oh so yeah. I, I think it the, hurt me for 13, 14 months going downstairs. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just was a long, involved process, yep. and uh, I'm assuming that they've probably got something now besides just the normal cadaver repairs. Is that the way they're? 
yes. still doing it, you think? Uh, I know some people still use the middle third of the tower tendon. I would never do it that way. That was, no, I, I guess, if you it, it doesn't make sense to, rejection or to, anything to like cut that. a healthy joint up to, no. or to, a healthy part of the knee to fix another part of the knee when you can go get donor parts. Right. You know. Yeah, this is back in... 94 when I had mine done. You said 96, same kind of surgery, and I guess they just did not have the the capability of of uh, harvesting cadaver parts back then like they do now. It's an interesting field that we probably don't want to talk about <laughs> during this interview. So, uh, you have been exposed to three separate in the NFL professional level strength and conditioning programs over the course of your career. We have, we have talked many times about, uh, about the quality of, of, of strength and conditioning coaching in, uh, in this business. And tell us a little bit about your experience with all three of these teams and, and what methods they were using and this sort of thing. And I think this will be extremely informative to a lot of people to hear some of this. So in 1999, I went to the Philadelphia Eagles. And at the time, we were still playing in Veterans Stadium. So, uh, you know, for those of you that know football, Veterans Stadium was built in the 70s and was pretty much about the one of the worst fields and worst facilities you could ever imagine. I ended up, ended up rupturing my toe tendon because my foot got caught in a seam on the turf. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, they actually can't, they, uh, they canceled the game because uh, the field was uneven and there was divots and holes. I mean, they basically just took some concrete, threw some uh, a putting green down on it, and that's what we played on. And uh, our facility for our weight room was, you know, uh, probably about the size of, uh, you know, it was a converted uh, uh, storage room, you know, back from the 70s, and it was packed with weights and different stuff. Like two, three thousand square feet. Oh, if, if that. It was yeah. probably a, it was probably a thousand fifteen hundred square feet at the biggest. Oh my God! Uh, packed with stuff. And this so, is in nineteen ninety nine. Nineteen ninety nine. So I show up there, and you know I came from a pretty decent weight room at Cal, and it was all packed with machines. And uh, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Mike Wolf and Tom Canavy. So Mike was the head guy, and Tom Canavy was the assistant. And Tom's now the head guy at Minnesota Vikings. Um, Two of probably some of the, the best strength coaches and two of the finest individuals I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. I mean, still to this day, I count them as close friends. And I was in kind of a unique situation because I came in as a rookie and, uh, you know, got to start and play. Um, strength and conditioning is an interesting deal with the NFL because they assume when you get there, you can play. They're not in the job developing. That's why people. they hired you. Yeah, because right. you can do it. Right. So most guys, uh, you know, aren't huge workout warriors. They show up with a lot of gifts that God gave them and they're just, yeah. they, they can play or you can't. So the weight room is more a matter of like, hey, um, uh, how do we get guys to train without you know, uh, being assholes and not being intrusive? How do we make it easy? Uh, Wolfie and Tom come from uh, Penn State and they were a big high intensity hit team. Right. And it was uh, all machine based, you know, one set to failure, different machines down the road. So you came in, you got a card and we're gonna do set uh, row one and you know, right. knock it out. So they had things aligned in yeah. circuits. So that, circuit one, circuit. circuit two, circuit three. Today, circuit one. Yeah. Right. So it was all uh, machine based. Um, I ended up getting injured and I kind of went on a different program because they put you on injured reserve. Right. And, uh, you know, no longer you pre you know, going to meetings and practicing with the team or doing different things. So your job basically becomes to rehab and to lift weights. Get, to get. So I became pretty tight with these guys. And from there, uh, we developed a pretty good relationship and my training really deviated from what was the norm in that uh, they, you know, while this was the, the training for the mass, the training that I got was far outside that scope. These guys were pretty creative. I mean, we had a, a, you know, a whole bunch of different free weights and my training became well, free weight based. And you had the background you needed yeah. from having trained with George and, and, and uh, having a background in, in yeah, actual Olympic barbell lifting. training. And well, well, yeah, I was fortunate when I went to college. I had a guy named Eric Cohn who was a pretty good coach. And then a guy named Todd Rice, who uh, I think he's at South Carolina now, who was a hell of right. an Olympic lifting coach. Right. And, you know, a lot of the things that those two guys instilled in me, I still took with me and realized, like, hey, I never really got strong lifting off machines because I never really saw a machine on the field. Uh, of, you know, of course not. So it's, it, it's and and we all know that it doesn't work. But it, that's that's a that's an interesting thing. 
of the people that you play with in the NFL, of the of the typical, like of a hundred guys in the NFL, what do you think the percentage of those guys are that actually have a background in what we know as as actual barbell training, actual functional training, and how many of them, conversely, are just relying on genetics? Because that's what the choice would be. Well, um, right? I think the idea is that. Um where people run into a big deal is that if you have an athlete who has a lot of uh, physical gifts, you know, you can pretty much ask him to do anything, even if it was training with a Nautilus machine, right. and he's going to get better. Exactly. Whereas, you know, you deal with, um, you know, you have to go find the most efficient, best way to train people. Uh, you give me the right population, and I can basically put them on a Busu ball with five-pound Nautilus, you know, fixed dumbbells, right. and they're going to get stronger. Yeah, stuff like that, and they're gonna, and they're going to get stronger. But it, you know, you take those same population and you put them into the type of strength training I did when I was a kid and the Olympic lifting. And I tell people all the time whenever they ask about the power athlete and the, the training that we were fortunate enough to have a pretty uh, excellent Olympic lifting coach who you know gave us some great programs, and we were doing a ton of sprinting, and he had a uh, you know some really great dynamic movements and a lot of sprinting stuff. When we mix that with the Westside Barbell Dynamic Efforts, Maximum Efforts, and the Conjugate Method was when we really found some magic in the programming and everybody got really strong. So right. um, 1996, uh, we were all you know chasing a big bench press and wanted a big squat and uh, happened to stumble across the Westside Barbell stuff and George had, uh, had always talked about the Westside Barbell because we actually had a reverse hyper in George's mm -hmm. garage when I was a kid and we used to use oh. it all the time. So he, it, he would always it. talk about Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell. So uh, we ended up calling him on the phone and talking to him a little bit, and we started incorporating that stuff. And next thing you know, everybody had a big bench and a big squat, and right. everybody was Olympic lifting big weights and really sprinting and running well. So um, if you look at my program, the way at least the one that I put out, um, you know, there's sprinting. Um, we do some, you know, we do maximum efforts, dynamic efforts. We throw in volume with uh, the five by fives and different right. stuff, and we mix in Olympic lifting. Right. And and but there are a, there are a lot of people in the NFL <coughs> that have not had that background, no, no. right? But you, Th you, that actually came out of a hit based program sure. or a, a bodybuilding based and, kind of a and body part strong. thinking, not movement based, but muscle group thinking. Sure. Yeah, train train at, you know <coughs> different muscle group once a week. But you got to I, I you know I played with a guy Brian Waters who uh, you know hadn't trained in six months. I watched him come in and bench five hundred pounds for reps. And, and that's the level of genetics you're dealing with at this rarefied level of athletics. Well, well you have to in, remember, in, I mean, look how, many, look how many kids are playing high school football today. Yeah. Right? And then, you, and then when you start pairing that down, there's, you know, uh, let's say there's 3 million kids playing high school football, and you pair that down to the 1,800 NFL players. You know, You've got a, a process that distills that level of athletic talent. Sure. Of so, course. This is precisely why, and we've talked about this a couple of times, uh, with, we talked about this with Shane. Uh, when Shane Hammond was here uh, a while back, Olympic weightlifting in this country is essentially ignored sure. as a sport. And it doesn't have the feeder system in this country that it does, for instance, in China, a country with 1.4 million coaches, well, can Olympic you lifting coaches, with well, Perhaps Olympic 15, 20 million Olympic lifters. Olympic lifting is to like what uh, football is in this country. Right. So exactly. can you imagine in lots of instead countries. of all these kids going to play football and all these little kids that there was Olympic, lift, uh, Olympic lifting training centers. Right. I guarantee that in 20 years, if, would if be all different. of a sudden we switch this up and we're like, okay, instead of putting our direction at football, we're going to give millions of dollars to Olympic lifters and we're going to put these in. I guarantee. Things would be entirely different be, at the Olympics. We would, would be stomping. Yes. Every country in the world, right? And it's just it, it's a um, uh, you know I mean I, we always talk about it, but um, you know so I I learned to Olympic lift and you know using it for football and you know had a 180 pound power clean, right? You know 108 kilo power clean. 108 kilo power, power clean. clean. The, so but the system is is very very good at identifying genetics. Sure. And the the primary function is as I perceive it of recruiters is recognizing this. Sure. 